one. Okay, we're recording, and I am with uh, Ricardo. Ricardo, how are you today? Fine, Sonny. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to, to be with you here in your show. Excellent, excellent. Well, thanks for coming on here. Um, you know, I usually start with uh, where did we first meet, or when did we first meet, rather? Uh, so I guess I, I remember that one, but uh, when, when did we first meet? It's been almost a year, more than a year, less than a year? Uh, more than a year, I think. It was yeah. on September of uh, 2019, yeah, and okay. it was in the blockchain forum in, in Paris. And right. Yeah, it was. I actually, I don't remember exactly the, 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 the panel, you know, mm. but yeah, it, it was a, a really good uh, forum. And yeah, I, I think that that year was a very good year in terms of building, you know, because there was not this euphoria uh, around crypto. Uh, so yeah, it was a very uh, easygoing uh, forum and easygoing year. It was not that uh, uh, a great year for, for building, you know, with not too much noise. And yeah, we met there and it was uh, really nice to hear your, your, your presentation and your, your uh, thoughts uh, around and your experience, of course, around um, the the issues with the in the Indian market, you know. And yeah, it was great to to hear you and all all the guys around. And, and at the time, Ricardo, um, so this was at the OECD, right, in Paris. Exactly. That, was, that was pretty cool. That was a fun time. Um, but I was going to ask you what uh, what. Uh, well, at the time, what were you up to again? Because you were you were part of some organization, right? I know now you're onto um, some other projects that we're going to speak about Avalanche specifically. <laughs> but at the time, what was it that you were doing? I remember it was something related to crypto in Latin America. Exactly. Yeah, I, I was with with some partners here in Mexico, um, and we were building. We we had a uh, consultancy firm around a digital transformation and crypto. And it was called oruca.co. And uh, yeah, we were uh, doing something in terms of education with, with universities. Also, uh, we were working with the um, German Development Agency, GEDZ. And uh, at that time, it was, uh, we were finishing, uh, we finished uh, one um, project. Uh, around traceability in um, uh -huh. coffee traceab traceability in Costa Rica. Mm. It was really, mm. really uh, interesting. Uh, it was my first time in Costa Rica. And for example, it was really interesting to see all the, the ecosystem in Costa Rica. It's a small country, you know, and, and not that noisy in terms of crypto. But a lot of Europeans, a lot of uh, North Americans uh, go to Costa Rica because of the nice weather, night beaches, uh, uh, cool people. And yeah, it's a very, very strong community. So yeah, it was really nice project uh, around uh, traceability. And you know that Costa Rica is just like this uh, green, green lab, you know, of sustainability lab. So it was really nice to, to, to work with, with the people around Costa Rica, with the uh, Coffee Institute in Costa Rica. They, they work uh, and really hard in terms of, they, they were like 10 years working around traceability. And when we talk about blockchain, it was really easy for them to, uh, to, to, to get the idea of blockchain that, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's something that uh, they speak with, not with that name, blockchain, but they need it uh, for traceability and because they want to, uh, to offer a different value than the coffee for Colombia, for example, that Colombia brings uh, good quality, but in, uh, big amounts. And with uh, Costa Rican coffee, they want to give uh, gourmet coffee, or very specific niche for, for Germany, for uh, Japan. So the idea of traceability and to know which farmer it's behind one product, it's a, it was a big differentiation for, for them. 
Interesting, interesting. Um, are you from Costa Rica originally? No, no, no. I'm from Mexico. Oh, you're from Mexico. Okay, I'm okay. from Mexico. Yeah. Okay, interesting. No, I was gonna say that I, uh, my brother got married in Costa Rica, so mm-hmm. I have uh, I've been there, and I, I agree, it's it's probably the most beautiful place I've uh, one of the most <laughs> beautiful places I've ever been to. It's just uh, it's it's beach beaches, the it's like uh, mountains, there's for, rainforests, it's like everything yeah. in one. Uh, exactly. But mind you, Mexico is also <laughs> one of the most beautiful <laughs> places I've been to as well. Whereabouts in Mexico are you? Uh, I'm living uh, uh, my place is Mexico City, but just because of COVID, I moved to uh, one small town that uh-huh. is close to Mexico City that's called Cholula. And it's a very nice spot. Yeah, that we have the volcano. Uh, we have a, sorry for the noise. Yeah, I'm gonna, no. yeah do you want me to pause it or are you good? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, every, everything, everything good. And and uh, here we have the biggest pyramid in in the world, actually, in terms of of the base of the pyramid. Hmm. It's huge. I don't I don't remember the exactly uh, uh, numbers, but and the iconic uh, thing about Cholula is that this pyramid, the Spaniards when they conquer uh, the people uh, around. They built a church in the top of the pyramid, so it's a quite nice, <laughs> nice spot. I mean, very touristic, and you have the volcano, you have the pyramid, and in the top a church. So it's, it's really. <laughs> yeah, really I definitely have a lot of questions around pyramids. Uh, maybe we'll <laughs> save that one for another uh, podcast. But I mean, they're fascinating. Every every time I learn about something about the pyramids, I'm like how did that even happen? Like it was so long ago and like, how could it have been so like mathematical? And there's so many things, interesting things about it. Um, hey, but I was going to say, so, uh, so, so my, one of my main kind of goals are, so in this kind of Bitcoin journey, right? Like now, obviously everyone's talking about Bitcoin and it's mm-hmm. like becoming not mainstream, but you know, it's, it's becoming more, more widely accepted mm-hmm. and known. Um, uh, is, is I'm, I find like people's stories to be fascinating, right? Like kind of what they're, I guess two parts. So I, I mean, for, I mean, you know, for whatever it's worth, I consider Bitcoin as a bit of a singularity event in most people's lives, right? It's like, <laughs> there's like pre understand knowing about this blockchain Bitcoin stuff, and then there's post. And so I'm curious to know people's, you know, kind of what their story was before they learned about it. Um, and then, you know, subsequently kind of how it affected their worldview, their, the, the arc of their career kind of, um, yeah. And then, and then, and then secondly, you know, talk more about like the project that you're involved in and, and would love to kind of know the story behind that and what kind of, you know, market opportunity you guys saw. Yeah, sure. So my background is economics. So it was not that excited a uh, career. I mean, just a normal one. I was a, uh, working in, in the federal government in Mexico. And uh, my career began in the Minister of Social, Social Development. So fighting against, against uh, poverty. It was a really, really interesting time. And then I moved, uh, I was invited to join the uh, tax office in, in Mexico in the IT uh, department. So it was, also really interesting. I was doing a financial assessment of investment around IT. And so it was, it was really, really interesting. I learned a lot around there. And I keep in the path of IT and, and financial assessment. And then in 2012, 2013, I take I took a break from the federal government, and I moved to Tulum, in, in the Caribbean, uh, just because why not? <laughs> and there, and there, there, uh, there is a very big community of Argentinians in Tulum, and one guy began to to, to talk, a random guy talk about uh, Bitcoin, and it was really interesting. Um, but I what, have... year, what year was this, Ricardo? Sorry, wait. And Tulum isn't isn't is Tulum close to Mexico? You, where did where is that? Uh, Tulum is in the Caribbean, so it's around a two flight, two hours flight mm. from Mexico City. 
Uh, but yeah, it be- Tulum belongs to to Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, okay. And uh, you know the Mayan Riviera that it's in the southeast of of Mexico. So this this random guy that I don't remember his name. I I remember that uh, he was uh, from Argentina. He begins to talk me about uh, Bitcoin. And actually, I think in Tulum, there is also a strong community of Bitcoiners. And and I was like, okay, it sounds interesting. I was, uh, at that time, I I saw uh, uh, this uh, issue about uh, uh, when Visa and MasterCard closed the funding for um, this guy. WikiLeaks? uh, And from WikiLeaks, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I know that. It's, it's a serious stuff, but I, I just don't understand. No, I, I, I was not, uh, I was curious about it, but not, I didn't understand it. Uh, uh, so I talk about it with my with my wife and she told me, yeah, it's something interesting, but uh, as almost everyone, we said, ah, it's interesting, but hey, we have other stuff to do, you know? Uh, uh, so then I, I, uh, I spent two years in Tulum and I uh, get invited again to, to return to the government, to the uh, Minister of Finance in, of the federal government in the area of um, deposit insurance in, in uh, the, the agency that uh, runs when, when a bank gets a bankruptcy. They give the people uh, people savings uh, to, to to the savers, you know. And I was in the area of international affairs and research, so I was looking for this uh, regulation and some innovation around the the sector. So uh, fintech began to to to, to be uh, strong stuff in, in the media, you know, in Financial Times, Bloomberg, and uh, suddenly I, I began to see something about Bitcoin in this mainstream media, you know, and I began to uh, to do research. There were some some um, ideas from a, some agencies. Uh, in the Netherlands, in Korea, around uh, if the insurance deposit agencies should uh, insure the crypto assets, specifically uh, Bitcoin. And I, I wrote some, some technical notes about it. And it was, I, I began to, to do research from my own, you know, that I returned from, from the office and I go to my computer at home, say, okay, I'm going to to do some research from, from my own. And it was just like, uh, it was amazing, you know, like uh, doing, uh, looking some videos from Andreas Antonopoulos or, or any other uh, guys on YouTube. And I was, oh, it's, this sounds really, really interesting. And so we are talking that from 2015 and 2016, I just keep just with this, not double life, you know, but yeah, I was doing my job. Uh, You're working around. for the government, you said? For the government, yeah. It was the, the it's like the FDIC from the States. But ah, the, one the in, FDIC in, in, equivalent. So that, mm-hmm. but I, I have interesting, so FDIC is like, uh, or even an organization like that is very entrenched in, you could say, you know, the way the world works, right? Like the way the world works today uh, in the, from the financial perspective. And so, and then you're working for the government, but then, you know, like the first thing is, uh, the first thing that people, when they hear about Bitcoin is they say, governments are going to ban it. <laughs> so, so I'm just wondering, did that thought cross your mind or were you, were you technical enough that you were like, you know what, there's some true innovation that just, I don't know, like, well, just curious, what was that? How was that conversation playing out in your head? <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it was really, really funny because um, I knew that it was something uh, very innovative that would bring a lot of disruption to, to the 
a traditional banking sector that is a really heavily regulated and not that agile. And, uh, but on the other side, I, I knew that uh, the FinTech wave in Mexico was really strong. And uh, as, as people didn't, uh, as regulators didn't, could, didn't ban uh, FinTech startups, uh, that would be the same. Uh, with Bitcoin, there would be no power to stop it. Um, but when I talk, talked with my uh, colleagues, uh, in, the, in the government, uh, I was surrounded mainly by economists, and it's it's funny because I, I I'm also an economist as I told you, but uh, it's easier to talk with uh, engineers, with lawyers, with accountants, with whatever you want, but not with economists. Economists, when you talk about Bitcoin, they say no, that's a scam, that's a Ponzi scheme, is not back, backed by anything. So why, I just, why is that? And, and I mean, yeah, maybe, yeah. I mean, I have a bunch of follow-up questions, but why is that? And, 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 you know, when you say you're an economist, does that mean you went to school to study that? And if so, mm-hmm. was it mostly like the Keynesian type of mm-hmm. economy, uh, economist worldview? Uh, but anyways, can you speak to that a little bit? Just curious. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so in Mexico, uh, mainly, um, the orthodox way of teaching economics, economics is that you learn uh, Keynesian economics, um, also monetarist economics, like, uh, and especially in the in private universities. And in some public universities, uh, you also learn a, a lot of, of theoretical and historical perspective, and also about uh, Marxism. Uh, but no one's uh, teach you about um, Austrian Austrian economics, you know. <laughs> so, so I even wonder why I wonder why <laughs> I, I have some theories. I don't okay, have the okay, okay. I, I, I don't have the the, 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 the facts to, to really uh, bet bet about it. But yeah, you know, it, it's uh, there are two main schools in Mexico. One is the ITAM, that is the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, that is at, the, at his beginning in, in the 16, 60, 60s, sorry. Uh, actually, they were Austrian, uh, uh, an Austrian school. But then this wave of monetarism around Friedman banish anything about uh, Austrian economics, uh, economics mm. on it. But it's a very uh, well reputed uh, school. Uh, it's around enge- engineers and economics. And, and the other one is called CIDE, that is uh, a research center of uh, economics research, let's say. And they are, they are more concerned about development and uh, poverty measurements, uh, mm-hmm. public policies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but yeah, when, you, when I do some research, did some research about what's going on with the uh, education of economics in Mexico, is that they, uh, they just ban, or not ban, but they erase anything uh, related to Austrian economics. Yeah, just because from my, my point of view is that uh, it's the, there is some like, uh, not propaganda, but uh, quite of, they just want to prepare you to, to work on the government or to go, work in the financial institutions, not wondering uh, what happened in, in 1971, you know, with the doll, when the dollar uh, erased the, the peg to the, to the gold, is that they just explained you that, uh, yeah, that senorage of fiat uh, currencies are, is something normal. And, and, uh, and, and I mean, you are 18, 19, 20 years old, you don't have that much uh, questions. And if you do it, it's because that's the way uh, the world works and that's it. And 
I think that the point is that you you are very young and you don't you you don't uh, question that strong. Uh, I'm really uh, I uh, quite mad mad with myself because uh, I could make a lot of questions to to professors that are brilliant professors, but uh, uh, to say. You, you spent half of your career doing mathematics, at least in, in my school. I, I, I love my alma mater, my school that it's UTLAB, Universidad de las Americas. I love my, my former university, but you keep, uh, I kept 50% uh, of the time studying economics, doing maths. And you were really, uh, you know, reading a lot of books, doing a lot of maths, and you knew that something did, it was there. There was something wrong, but you didn't have just the the tools to 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 question or to say, "Hey, this doesn't make any sense." And I I I, I finished my career without uh, my studies, without knowing about um, Hayek, for example, a, a Nobel Prize. I knew about <laughs> Hayek. <laughs> When I was outside yeah. of university, yeah. and I think that that, that uh, 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 the average economic economists in Mexico don't know about Austrian economics, haven't heard what uh, Hayek, for example, did. So it's quite strange. Quite strange. You you should write the 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 Bitcoin's manual for economists or something like just speaking to the Keynesian crowd, like di di dispel all the the myths. But but what what are those though? I mean, like if you can just kind of summarize like the two or three maybe main points that you think you know you said you could tell there's something wrong. But what what were those things? Yeah, because that is at the heart of everything, right? That's why we're all here. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, for, uh, I was curious because, for example, in my family, my my dad was a doctor. Uh, he just did like the medicine school, but he didn't get specialized. Uh, he was the first guy that went to school. Blah blah blah. And I was curious that in Mexico, between after the Second World War until the 71, there was a, a period that was called the Mexican miracle because uh, Mexico was growing uh, around six, seven percent uh, per year. But, and it's related because the currency was strong. It was related, I think, to like, uh, I think 12 pesos per dollar during 30 years. So you have a, you had a, a really uh, very uh, center uh, a lot of certainty around uh, the the economy, you know. So and uh, and I was wondering why a, a lot of people could make a, could afford a, a very good quality of life, and why now um, uh, my friends or my older friends uh, that are doing a master degree and that, that they uh, have a, a, a master in, in Europe or in the States. And I, I could see this um, inequality. I say, this, it's, it's not working in, in Mexico. And, and I didn't know what happened in, in, in the 71, you know? After 71, in Mexico, there were uh, currency devaluations Every six years, every change of government, uh, the currency just uh, lost a lot of, of power, uh, purchase, purchase power. So I, I was like, like uh, yeah, we, we can do uh, like uh, public policies uh, around uh, cash transfer, uh, around education, around um, poverty elevation, but after 20 years of these cash transfers, conditional cash transfers, cash transfers, sorry, uh, there was no real impact on, on poverty alleviation. So I say, we can keep just doing this stuff about uh, cash transfers, but you don't see people really getting a 
uh, good quality of life, just like 40 years ago, when you get to, to the university and you were guaranteed to be able to buy a home, to buy a car, to, to send your, your sons uh, to, to the university. Right now, people is really struggling. And we, um, in Mexico, we are lucky to, to be close to the, to the main economy, uh, that is the, the states. So I, I just saw like uh, 20, 30 percent of my friends of the elementary school just drop university and let's say, okay, I'm going to the, uh, to the states just like, like an immigrant because here I don't have any, any hope in Mexico. So right now there are like, I think like 30 million of Mexicans in, in the States. And because of remittances, the country keeps going, you know? Uh, remittances are, are the, uh, an important fuel for the economy. And say, and we could keep doing this technical, uh, stuff in, in, in the government when I was in the Ministry of Social Development. Uh, I could do a master degree in social development, uh, but it's going. To, I know the recipes, and I know that these recipes doesn't work. Uh, don't work. So what's going on? I I, I never found like um, a master program that I was fell in love with it. So I just keep uh, working until. I knew Bitcoin, for example. When I knew Bitcoin, I fell in love with, with, with it. So I began to read a lot. I began to, to, to see a lot of uh, YouTube videos. And, and you know, uh, I knew about Telegram. And actually, and, and I really go deeper in Bitcoin when I joined a, a political movement in Mexico that has had in mind decentralization and, and uh, localism, for example. Uh, actually, it was called Wikipolitica. Uh, that is just like Wikipolitics, mm -hmm. you could say that. And there were really, really clever guys, uh, clever people. Uh, at that time, I was around third, between my, my 30 and 35 years old. I was in that, with that guys. Um, and uh, they teach me a lot of stuff about uh, technology, decentralization, and of course, cryptocurrencies. And that, mm. that began what my trip really deep uh, uh, with Bitcoin and, and crypto. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so what, uh, I guess, but, but just on the Bitcoin note though, the fact that like what, what, what if you had to sum up kind of the main differences um like when you because we talked about austrian economics right versus kind of like keynesian what are those things like i mean for example one thing that comes to mind is that <clears throat> bitcoin is deflationary mm -hmm, in nature mm -hmm. right like that's i think an idea that i mean again it's just it's just like an idea but it's it's talked about in more kind of extensive terms within austrian economics so that's one thing. Are there other elements of Bitcoin that that kind of resonate with Austrian? I know, I know. I even saw a quote this morning. I think from Satoshi's writing saying how the libertarian philosophy will really um, kind of take to Bitcoin. And he said, "I'm mm -hmm. not too good with words. I'm not as good with words as I am with code." <laughs> and so, um, anyway, so yeah. So the curious. So what what is it? Because I know Austrian economics has a lot to do with also liberty and libertarianism and freedom and all that. Exactly. Yeah, I think one of the of the main features that, or difference, let's say, is the the role of debt in, in, in Keynesian economists economics. You know, because uh, Keynesian Keynesian um, economic economists uh, rely on debt. You know, and everything works because of debt. If, if there is no debt and, and if banks, uh, commercial banks, central banks don't print money, there is no economy. There is no fuel to, to run the economy. And you know, this, uh, uh, the banks in, on their normal 
uh, situations in the normal world of uh, it's they have just a partial back of deposits you know like normally it's around a uh, 10% of the of the deposits keep uh, are kept in, in in the bank the other is just debt 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 that, that keeps uh, the monetary base growing 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 more debt more cons more consumption and 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 for example the uh, Australian economics, they say you have, you must have full reserve on, on, if you are a bank, you need to have full reserve of the deposits. So this keeps, this debt keeps, uh, you can manage it and there is no artificial uh, money, there is no uh, money production out of air, you know, so I think that debt, it, it's a key factor then uh, that uh, you can see uh, in the, the States is, is a clear example. Everything is debt, you know? Uh, and when you see that, for example, this idea that uh, when people in the 70s or in the 80s couldn't afford a home, uh, they say, ah, but don't worry, we can give you a, a mortgage. And you can you can uh, afford uh, a home, but uh, I saw many friends of my parents, uh, or I'll, at least I was I I was talked that they could uh, buy a home just with their savings. Right now, I I don't know almost nobody that could say, okay, I like that house, and I'm going to 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 buy it. You know, at least. Uh, uh, my, my father's generation, when they were like 25, 30, 35, they could say, okay, I have my wife, uh, uh, I have uh, two kids, um, okay, it's time to buy a house and I have the savings to do it in Mexico. Right now, it's, it's not possible. So uh, just because these uh, dynamics of the, of the economics uh, are crazy, and of course, the, the rent seeking uh, of the of the banks uh, is really, really strong. And, and I, I think in almost all the world, but especially in, in Mexico and in the States, are, uh, are they, they have a lot of, uh, they want to not, not too much changes on it because yeah, just keep that running and, you know, you don't, you cannot, you can't afford a house just because you don't work harder enough. Uh, but here is your mortgage. So yeah, I think. Uh, do you, do you know what mortgage means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, when 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 you um, you want to buy a house. No, no, no. But they, you know the actual word. Do you know what it means? I no, think no, no. I think I could be wrong. But <laughs> when I when I looked it up and when I read it, uh, it means till death. Okay. Mort, Mort is dead. Yeah, H. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always found the idea of mortgage. I used to like, I don't know, we use air quotes. I used to be a financial advisor like a long time ago. And, <laughs> okay. uh, and yeah, I mean, I always, whenever I tell people my story, I was like, I, I became a financial advisor in pursuit to understand money. Mm -hmm. I truly felt at the end of that journey that I, I understood less about money than I did at the beginning. So you you write the manual for economists, I'll write one for financial advisors. <laughs> I think it might sound very similar. Let's do a collaboration. Yeah, um, sure, sure, sure. Oh, no, but I, I think it's, in, I think it's, in, see, that's the thing is like when people say like Bitcoin is not just a technology. I mean, it just captures, you know, so many different ideas and thoughts and it is technology at the end of the day, but um, it's also very philosophical and uh, apolitical. I don't know. It's, it's it's cool. It's cool. So what, what what about your story? So where does it take you next? So then you you get into Bitcoin. You hear about it from this guy mm -hmm. uh, randomly. Then you revisit it because of I mean you're, so you have this like secret kind of passion. No, none of your colleagues. Um, they all think you're crazy for even bringing yeah. it up. Okay. So now exactly. what, what happens? Like your wife is somewhat supportive. She hasn't mm -hmm. left you. So what 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 what, what happens after that? <laughs> ah, that, that that's a very very important uh, key key factor in my decision or in my path because in Mexico uh, in 1994 
there was a huge uh, crisis, the tequila crisis, actually. Uh, so the banks just banish all the savings of the people. So my, my wife... Wait, it was, it was called the tequila crisis? The tequila crisis. Wait, so they banished at what they did? They did what? Say that again, uh, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. So it was just like the, the brand of the of the crisis. The tequila okay, they didn't crisis. come for people's tequila. Oh, thank God. No, okay, no, no, okay, no, okay no. continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. So the, uh, so the, the banks hmm. uh, just run, off, run out of money. They just go bankrupt. Okay, okay. And uh, because they just were giving a lot of uh, credits yeah, actually yeah. for for uh, houses mainly so people lost their their homes uh, and uh, my, my wife was uh, one of these or her family was one of these uh, families affected so she was not uh, she don't like banks since they, since I know her, and uh, I didn't uh, have a close relationship with banks because I don't like debts. Uh, something that my my father uh, told me that yeah, you know, if you you cannot buy something, don't ask for a, for a credit. Just you you can't buy it. Period. So uh, when I I began to explain her. And we began to see uh, videos together and read the stuff together. He said, oh, this is very interesting, very interesting. And, and she keeps uh, with me in this passion, actually. So uh, then we decide to, uh, to run our business with a friend uh, uh, that we met in this uh, political movement, Wikipolitica. Uh, we say, OK, you know. Uh, you are economist. He was an uh, electrical engineer, and my wife was uh, she's like a business administration uh, career. So we uh, we began our consultancy firm. Uh, but and I have to to quit my job in the government. I said, okay, I don't want to keep working. It's a nice job. Uh, nice environment, but I, I don't feel this passion that I feel with Bitcoin and crypto. And I say, okay, do you support me if we if I quit my job and we begin uh, to work in this adventure with with crypto and technology? And she, my wife, was very supportive. And uh, yeah, we were we were not really sure what we were doing <laughs> with Oruka our consultancy, but then uh, some uh, universities hire us to, to do some uh, training with, with people, to give some uh, uh, classes or, or workshops, and um, yeah, the um, uh, ecosystem in Mexico City is quite strong. Uh, you know, it is uh, one of the main startups, I think in Latin America, actually, it's a uh, Bitso, that is yeah, the yeah. Mexican exchange. Yeah. And uh, they were running at that time, uh, almost weekly meetups in, in some universities. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you began to see during 2017, that, that it, this is small meetup, meetups with 20 and then 40 people, and at the end of 2017, there was like 300 people in a big auditorium mm -hmm. going crazy. Uh, so it was a, a really a good timing to, to begin to work with crypto, with Bitcoin, uh, some other uh, universities like the University, uh, Anahuac University, the Itam University began to, to reach us uh, to, to ask for, for training and to give some workshops. Uh, also some, some banks began to, to ask for, for our services. Uh, but we, we were not, we didn't have like a, uh, a real product. We were just doing whatever people asked for ask us uh, to do it. Mm. So we were quite tired of that dynamic. Uh, so, um, if in 2000 and 
2019, my wife said, okay, I just want to go deeper into the, into the IT sector. And she went to the Netherlands to make a, a postgraduate course. And I said, okay, let's go. <laughs> and that's why, and then uh, I, I was in many, many Telegram chats of, of crypto. And I just saw that there was the Berlin Blockchain Week and uh, the OECD uh, Blockchain Forum. I said, oh, it was almost in the same week. And I said, eh, you know, I think I, I, I want to do it. I, ha I got the, the entrance for, for the OECD uh, Forum. And I, some friends uh, will be in the Berlin Blockchain Forum and I, arrange a meeting with the people from Avalanche that was uh, to give a, a speech on, on the Berlin Blockchain Forum. And in the Netherlands, I was just being uh, like uh, going with my wife, but I was in charge of, of the, of, of at home, you know, cooking and getting everything uh, arranged just doing some collaborations, uh, writing some blocks, block uh, entrance or, or uh, not real, a real job in the Netherlands. So I say, okay, you know, I'm going next week or I don't know, two weeks uh, to Berlin and to Paris, just to these important events because I'm going to meet people from Avalanche and I don't know, the OCD, OCD is uh, quite, uh, important event and yeah then and that that um, that week just my my life changed suddenly this was the week that, the, that we met exactly or, or, okay 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 so when you were when we met at the oecd you were but you were speaking no 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 i was i was just like a, a you were on the forum attending yeah just attending the the the, the, the forum right 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 you no, know, but I thought you were. I thought you were because you were. At, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When actually in your in your panel, you know, it was this huge uh, auditorium, but uh, everyone was seated around. Yeah. So, I I mean I I think that I I talked about. Uh, you my, did a presentation, I think, as well, right? Yeah, about the Costa Rican experience with yeah. disability, and uh, yeah, I speak because. They, they, there was the opportunity, but I was not that uh, like big speaker, you know, as you. <laughs> and yeah, so uh, in Berlin, the people from, from Avalanche, like uh, Emin Gunsider, invite me to, to take care of the Latin American community or to, to rise and to, to, to grow this community and uh, yeah i say yeah sure why not so I, I mean okay so i know a lot of people might not know i mean maybe people do but i know a lot of people might might not know avalanche but before we get into avalanche i think a lot mm -hmm. of people would know emin because i've known about emin since like forever mm -hmm. but uh, do you know a little i know he was a professor at, at cornell university correct Exactly. And uh, and by the way, he's got an invite to come on here if he ever wants. Um, but I was going to say is, is that what can you just share a little bit about his background and then maybe the story behind Avalanche? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So he's uh, uh, or he was a professor of uh, computer science at Cornell. He's a Turkish American uh, professor. And uh, in 2002, he developed the first um, digital asset that uses proof of work. So six years before uh, Satoshi or the white paper. So um, yeah, I, I began to follow him on Twitter. I don't remember exactly why. I just yeah, began to follow him. And I, I, I really like it. Uh, one point of him that he's, he's pinned a tweet i really like it let, let me read it because sure i think it, it's it's important uh, that's why I, I i decided to join uh, avalab so his tweet says he's uh, a strong um, 
he have a strong background of, of academy, blah, blah, blah. But so the tweet says, so many academics forget that our goal as a profession is not to publish papers, is to change the world. So I said, nice, because I, I have been in touch with a lot of people from the academia. And sometimes they say, oh, let's publish papers. And that's it. Really nice papers, but not to really push and, and look for a change in our uh, society that, you know, uh, we're background in India or and from me in Mexico. There are a lot of problems that are, uh, a paper published in a, in a big journal or an important journal doesn't necessarily make a huge difference in people's lives, you know, from my point of view, at least. And, and the background from, from Gun is that he really wants to, to change things. So um, he uh, began a startup, I think in 2016, that was called Bl uh, Block X road, something like that. I don't really remember. And uh, then uh, he get involved with, uh, with the Team Rocket white paper that is similar to Bitcoin, you know, that someone dropped it on, on, uh, on the internet. And um, yeah, and he saw there are two co-founders of Avalabs, uh, Kevin Sekniki. Uh, that he's from, I think that Albania, perhaps, uh, something about, around the Balkans. And Ted Jean, that uh, he was also doing a, his PhD. And he uh, is one of the co-authors of the Libra white paper. He, uh, he developed a hot stuff and he then returned to, to Avalabs to begin this trip with, with Avalanche. Wow, what a crazy team. Uh, <laughs> that, so what's, uh, and so what's the, uh, yeah, what's the kind of the, you know, what, again, opportunity did they see in the space? So like, you know, Bitcoin has a place, Ethereum has a place, there's, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of other crypto <laughs> assets. Um yeah, and just but I guess just a couple of things that I do I do appreciate though that the, the notion of you know being able to turn academic and theory into practice. I spent eight years in uh, in robotics working for and I think I believe he was you know he was an Albanian uh, I forget but anyways a guy named Dr. Jacob Apkarian um, who <clears throat> was a professor for I think like you know a majority of his career. And then uh, decided to start Kwanzer, the company I worked for for eight <laughs> years, really in hopes of bridging that gap for universities, meaning we, we literally built and sold hundreds of different types of robots uh, okay. that, that thousands of engineering schools around this, the world, including, you know, uh, University at Los Andes and uh, to, uh, <laughs> you know, IIT, MIT, Stanford, Georgia Tech, uh, University of Toronto. I mean, thousands of universities use his product. And so, and he was one of those people that, you know, kind of decided to really put an effort into like bridging that theory and, and practice. So I, I always took a lot from there, but I was going to say on the, uh, on the avalanche, you know, what, what kind of um, like mathematical or like technological edge did they see that they could bring to the market that, you know, they couldn't do on top of Ethereum already or on top of, you know, cause I think, yeah, yeah, I'm curious. Exactly. Yeah, I think that that one of the the main purpose was to erase this trilemma problem. You know, that the what all, problem? Sorry, the, the trilemma, trilemma problem. You know, mm. scalability, security, and decentralization. So they were really thinking about there is a, some way to to to, re, to solve it uh, with no trade off. Just like uh, let's say, for example, uh, EOS that. Yeah, it, it scales really well uh, and it, it's uh, secure, but you know, it's a, a centralized solution with only 21 validators. So I think that the main point for them is, uh, or for us, <laughs> is to, to bring this solution 
uh, decentralized, safe, and, and that scales uh, just as as good as let's say Visa. That is, it's obviously it's a centralized uh, solution, but uh, they they saw that opportunity to to really bring this um, internet of finance. You know, the, the, the finance sector really uh, need fast solutions, uh, you know, the, uh, to a normal trade, to wait uh, one hour, like in Bitcoin to get settled is, is, is not enough, you know? You know, I, I, I think that Bitcoin, uh, it's a great solution for, uh, at least in the, in the midterm, for really big settlements, for huge amount, uh, amounts of money, but not for, let's say, uh, pay a, a course on, on Coursera, let's say, or whatever. No? It's, it's going to be uh, something uh, similar to gold, you know, that nobody pays with gold. And Ooh, what's uh, the trilemma again? Sorry, scalability, decentralized, and safety. cost? Safety, okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that they, they saw that that uh, opportunity that uh, if you bring a strong solution, safe, uh, that scales and decentralized, it could bring something really viable or, or valuable to the, to the finance sector, you know, that they don't really care about decentralization per se, you know, that uh, as long as technology brings a solution to a pain point uh, that right now they need to solve, they, they are going to, to, to see you. But if not, they, it's not a, a great point uh, or the, or the um, sale uh, phrase to say that, um, look, my solution is decentralized. I don't know, a, a bank would, would not care about it. And uh, so bring all these new kind of, of assets that uh, could be uh, trade uh, without this huge uh, cost or huge fees, just like right now with Ethereum, for example, it was another point that they want to, uh, to solve. So uh, yeah, th this idea to bring this uh, like the like the email for for finance in 2020, I think that was the the, the main idea that, that we had. No, yeah, like cool cool send um, digital assets just as easy as we sent a, a, a message on WhatsApp or or an email. You know that right now we don't care how WhatsApp or email works, we just use it. So we have in mind just the same with digital assets and with finance, just to, to, to exchange value uh, without, without the complexity that, you know, that I think one of the, um, these opportunity areas, areas on the ecosystem blockchain is user interface, you no? Know? At the beginning, in 2017, when I went deep to, to crypto, I was really afraid of how does this work and my seed phrase and, and, and my, uh, you know, everything that now it's, uh, it's more common. But at the beginning, I was, I'm not an engineer. I'm afraid of this te technology, you know? So, and I think that the ecosystem has done a lot in order to just the average people to use uh, digital assets and to, and to use crypto as a whole, you know? How long have they been working on this project? So they, they launched when this year, right? And by the way, I saw, I checked on CoinMarketCap. It's already, I think, one of the top, you know, 50 or 100 crypto assets. I saw it on the first page. That's pretty impressive. But uh, I'm, I'm a bit surprised I hadn't heard about them, you know, before <laughs> you and I touched base recently. But uh, but yeah, but, but curious what, um, 
but you know, maybe, maybe somebody technical then on your team, then at one point I could do a follow up on them. Cause I am curious, like, for example, when I think about things like lightning and I mean, you know, RSK, that mm-hmm. smart contract, lightning, which makes it faster and cheaper. And, and so I always, I mean, I think a lot of people in Bitcoin are, are kind of a little bit wary about, well, what are some other crypto assets trying to, <laughs> you know, I think Ethereum feels the, the, the brunt of that. But, you know, I'm, I always say I'm, 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 I'm a free market and like, I definitely like Bitcoin. You can't, you can tell. Uh, I love, <laughs> love Bitcoin would probably be a more appropriate term. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to be one of those like closed minded people that's like mm-hmm. not even willing to listen or learn about what's out there. I, I think it's important to, yeah, be pro innovation, pro free market, exactly. and, uh, yeah. and 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 again, I do definitely uh, connect with the Bitcoin, you know, maximalist uh, kind of cult. <laughs> 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 um, what? Uh, but okay, so 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 interesting, interesting, great team, uh, you know, very cool, uh, very cool. So I guess if I had to summarize, then <clears throat> it's like you know, you know, if Bitcoin is digital gold, Ethereum is you know, kind of like the world computer. It's probably not even mm-hmm. their latest marketing thing. But if it's like a smart contract that uh, that you know, Turing complete, whatever you want to say, then this is more like a faster version of Bitcoin and Ethereum and more decentralized. I guess I'm just curious. Like, how, how do I explain it to my mom? <laughs> okay. So, does it so- also does it also maintain its like you know like you know Bitcoin is limited, for example, to twenty one okay, million. Okay. Ethereum is like disinflationary, is I think the word they that that Vitalik told me. <laughs> so, anyways, my curious, did you do? Have you dug into that the economic yeah, of it? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so there are it has many many features, inter- interesting features. For example, let's say the the, the monetary um, the economics behind it. It has a limited cap of uh, seventy hundred and seventy. Right, seventy hundred and twenty thousand uh, Avax tokens. You know, so it's 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 capped you know, from that side, and it has uh, the the curve similar to to Bitcoin in terms of inflation. Uh, one important important feature, for example, is that that the the fees do not uh, return to miners or. or or to the one that that uh, solves the the nonce in, in the in the block, the fees are burned. So this deflationary uh, effect actually um, it's it's bigger in in avalanche because uh, the supply curve is increasing in a decreasing uh, rate, but because of the fees are collected and burned. The the Avax tokens that kept in, in in the market are decreasing effectively more than let's say uh, Ethereum, or Bitcoin, or whatever. No, so uh, that's on that uh, on this side. Uh, one important also uh, factor in in its design is that, uh, and I think that is it's um, the point that uh, on normal uh, blockchains, you know, the one that solves, uh, the miner that solves the, the block, it gets all the rewards or all the, the new mining coins and also the, the fees. With Avalanche, um, the rewards and uh, the, yeah, the, the, the new Avax tokens are uh, given are given to all the block validators you know because there is no leader in this consensus uh, protocol so it depends on the uh, amount of a stake that you uh, give to to the to the network and to the um, uh, also the infrastructure that you bring in terms of uh, if you if your node goes offline, let's say twenty uh, percent of the time, so you are not going to to get that twenty percent of of rewards. So uh, right now we have more or less like uh, six hundred uh, node validators that are actively uh, doing uh, blocks, uh, you know, and. Um, 
all the other important feature is that it, it has three important uh, components or three important elements. Uh, one uh, that are called chains. Uh, one is the platform chain, uh, P-chain, that it uh, coordinates the, the nodes. These uh, 600 uh, validators, it can scale to 1,000 or there is no actually technical limit to uh, the number of no nodes, you know? So, uh, and this P chain is important because uh, one feature of Avalanche is that you can uh, develop or deploy uh, as many subnets as you want. And what is a subnet? A subnet is a, a, a group of validators that uh, run a virtual machine and uh, can um, run uh, many blockchains. So this brings more, more, gets interesting because, you know, for example, uh, let's say Ethereum. Ethereum just have one uh, group of validators, one virtual machine and one blockchain. With Avalanche, there are uh, many groups of validators that uh, uh, run a virtual machine and they can uh, develop or, or run many blockchains in that virtual machine. So that's the, the, the platform uh, chain. On the other hand, we have the uh, exchange chain, the exchange. So in that chain, you can um, create as many assets, digital assets, as you want, and it's it works not in a not with a blockchain. It works with a, a DAG, you know, a, a direct acyclic graph, and so it scales almost to or around forty, sorry, four thousand and five hundred transactions per second. That it's a really important number. You know, it's it's even. Uh, uh, bigger than the transactions that Visa uh, does in a uh, Black Friday, for example. And mm -hmm. sorry, have you heard of Conflux? Just curious. No, not really. I must confess. No, I haven't heard. That's about. okay. It's okay. Continue. Continue. No, it's okay. okay. I'm just <laughs> yeah. Continue. And uh, so this this uh, uh, this chain. Uh, is designed to deploy NFTs, uh, tokens, whatever you you want you want to to exchange with with with, uh, with other people. So uh, and then we have the C chain that is the contract chain that uh, by default it's uh, is the Ethereum, Ethereum virtual machine on it. And, but with the difference that it can scale uh, more than, than 100 or 200 transactions per second. So, in, and you know that in Ethereum, it's around, cor correct me, it's around 20, 25 transactions per second, I think. So you have almost TX uh, number of transactions on the uh, contract uh, chain, which you can deploy adapt uh, decentralized app that it's uh, running on Ethereum, you can deploy it just uh, straightforward on, on Avalanche. You have a, con a smart contract on Ethereum, you can deploy it uh, on Avalanche with uh, because it runs or it supports the Ethereum virtual machine with the difference that it uh, runs with the Avalanche protocol. So uh, that's the, the like the Avalanche platform. Yes, uh, in a quick uh, review. Well, why is it uh, called Avalanche? Ah, that, that's important because um, uh, the idea of the Avalanche consensus is that it begins um, with, or it works with some samples. So you, you bring uh, a transaction and a note ask randomly to other nodes, uh, if this transaction is valid or not, or no. So, uh, and then uh, randomly repeats with other validators around it. And 
it brings uh, a stability of, on, on its decision. So the point is that it begins just like a snowflake and it runs just like, a, like an avalanche, you know? So, because it begins just with, with one node and uh, it scales just to the whole network and, and in, in less than two or three seconds. That's an important feature in, in the finalization of transactions on Avalanche are done in two, almost uh, one second uh, most of the time. So I think that that's, that's an important feature that I, I must uh, um, say it again, that the fi finalization of, of the transactions on the Avalanche platform are in, in less than one second or let's say two seconds. So, uh, and the idea that this snowflake, that is a node or a transaction, uh, that it gets uh, sampled in all the whole network and it brings consensus just like uh, in a very uh, fast way. Uh, it's, it's the idea of this snowflake that develops as a, or deploys an, an avalanche. Cool. Yeah, and then, so if people want to um, learn about it, there's like a white paper and all that, I assume, right? And what's the, what is the website? Yeah, Avalabs.org or Avalabs. also avax.network, both uh, work. And I think if people want to, to reach the, um, the documentation, the right uh, website is docs.avax.network. And yeah, as, as uh, also to mention that uh, the uh, Avalanche white paper was published, published on uh, May of 2018. So, you know, after two and a half years, we are on mainnet. So if, no, if we are not the fastest, fastest team, we are on one of, the, of them, huh? you know, that, that after two years, have uh, uh, operative uh, mainnet on blockchain. I think that it's it's a, a good record. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you guys, you guys didn't do an ICO, right? Or how did you guys cut it to market? Or was there? I, I don't even remember. Yeah. How it was. So uh, on February of 2019, there was a, a seed round. Uh, that it was around six million dollars that were raised. Mm. Sorry, and um, then was um, on June from this year there was a private sale, and uh, on August was the the public sale, uh, and in the in the public sale. Uh, it was around $42 million. Uh, it was designed uh, to, to be for uh, two weeks, but uh, we sell all the tokens in four hours, four hours and a half, actually. So, what? so yeah, it, 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 you know, in August, it was not clear this bull run around crypto. So it was on one really big hit on the market that in four hours we, we got uh, for 42 million dollars and uh, we had we had also a uh, incentivized testnet where people all the world we, we, we reach 1000 validators on our testnet and the validators got some some uh, tokens as well so because we, we, we are we really want uh, a really decentralized uh, network, and I think we, we are uh, we are achieving it in terms of when when you see more than six six hundred uh, node validators, uh, it's bigger than or a bigger number than other blockchains that have been in the space for one, two, or even three years around. Yeah. Okay. That's fascinating. Uh, 
Okay, anything else you want to mention on Avalanche? I mean, anything that I maybe didn't a- ask that you wanted to share? Uh, you know, and obviously, I like this is not financial advice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. People should do their own research. But I mean, I, I just find, you know, everything in this space to be super interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I, and then, I mean, and, you know, and there are a lot of uh, obviously very scammy projects. And, and so um, I like ones that have obviously some sort of like, you know, value that they're bringing to the world. And especially when there's like a team that's solid. I mean, you guys have kind of gone through all the the hoops and, you know, and so now it's like, uh, okay, so sorry. Yeah. You were going to say something. Yeah. No, that, yeah. I think that it's very, um, we had a very good timing uh, with uh, one product that we, we made a joint venture with um, Rocher. That not, not uh, Rocher is a, a lawyer buffet, and also with uh, Republic, this crowdfunding platform in the states to bring um, initial litigation offerings. That are it's it's important to to know about it. So the idea behind it is that when you have a class action and you want to do this crowdfunding for uh, uh, legal expenses, uh, you, you can uh, deploy some tokens on the Avalanche network and do and raise money in order to, to, can, uh, to bring these expenses of the litigation. And um, the, these tokens are liquid and its value it's related with the expected result of the litigation, you know? So, um, and actually- That is yes. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the first- Do this applies to anything, like anything? Like I, I drop uh, McDonald's hot coffee on, on, on my, you know, pants and I want to sue McDonald's. I can go and do a, a Kickstarter on, on your platform. Yeah, yeah, you, you can do it. But <laughs> and, and, and the first one, it's uh, a litigation in California that mm. around 1,000 acres that just the authorities just cut every, everything. Uh, it was, I, I don't know the number of the, the sorry, the names. 1,000 what? What did you say? Acres or like, activists? No, no, no. Uh, Agorists? No, this measurement of a square, I mean, a square meters or. Uh, I don't, yeah, it's, it's, Haker? A- hectares? A- uh, sorry, acres? Let me write it because, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it. And in, in acre, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. So the one thousand of these things that is huge okay. land. Acres? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and okay. Uh, the authorities just caught it, and uh, the the guys that are suing the authorities, they say that that the damages are around one one thousand uh, million dollars. Uh, that's in Spanish. In, in English, is one billion dollars of, of damages. So it's quite interesting. And actually in the morning, I, I was looking at the uh, Telegram and Twitter also, and people is actually organizing to do an, an initial legal offering against Ledger, Ledger, for example, with this leak of information of, uh, of the wallets, you know, the, the cold wallets. Uh, you you have here about ledger of course of course of course yes so, yes so you're saying this could be like a crowdfunding mechanism for l- lawsuits like it's like a wait wh- how does this happen today wait no but like today obviously if somebody wanted to sue ledger they would just get like a like get like some big law firm together right but actually actually uh, uh, in the states it's a industry that is called uh, litigation finance so there are uh, firms that uh, go to, uh, with uh, family offices and investment funds <laughs> to, to raise money and say, okay, you know, actually uh, during this year, the average uh, return on, okay. of these kind of investments, it's around 60%. Uh, okay. So it's a juicy so you're saying that you, like okay so you're saying that you, you you got your platform is is designed for or you guys have some application i saw yeah, emin it, tweeted out yeah it's just one use case for, for, for initial for, litigation offering 
Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, we are not all the whole platform is not just for ILOs. It is it's just one use case. Right. right. And I, I think but that what makes it's, it such a good uh, platform for that that use case? Why? Uh, Why would someone use Avalanche for that? Okay. Uh, for, from the business point, is that right now is is just uh, your the the litigation finance is just for big funds or, or big wallets, you know. So with uh, the initial litigation offerings, uh, the retail investors can act, uh, actively participate on these uh, uh, sues or, or these litigations. So uh, that's for, from the business per perspective. And on the other side, uh, on the technological side, side is that uh, these tokens of the initial litigation offerings are uh, liquid from the beginning or from, from, from the launching of the ILOs to the, to the end of the process. Because right now, uh, people invest in the in litigation finance and they have to wait until the end of the, of the legal case to see its returns. But right now you can invest and during the whole process, you can trade your tokens with 100% of, of liquidity. So, and <laughs> if you have one platform that Damn. finalizes uh, transactions in one second, it's just like a huge market that is liquid totally and, and brings you one real use case, you know? No, but why, uh, I could build the same thing on Ethereum, right? Or somebody could. I'm just wondering, like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, but then the reason somebody might not want to is because the fees are super high. Exactly. More or less is uh, to deploy uh, that's funny that that's the criticism for Ethereum. Isn't that why they started <laughs> or something? Like I don't know. They said Bitcoin's fees were too high. Okay. The the, uh, the cost <laughs> to, uh, the, the, of a deployment of a contract in uh, Avalanche is one one tenth of of Ethereum. You know, it's ten times uh, cheaper on Avalanche than in Ethereum. Yeah. So how to much the, what to, is it like? Let's say, for example, how much? Uh, let's are, say uh, I don't know. How, like a couple uh, hundred dollars versus a couple thousand dollars type of thing. No, actually, uh, uh, let me let me let me try to remember. I think that in, in if in Ethereum is something is around ten dollars, mm -hmm. uh, in in Avalanche is less one, than one dollar uh, for a really easy going uh, smart contract. No, more or less that that's the the average. Um, we have a, a, actually. A, I, I gotta read more about it, but it, I mean, it's, how do you even keep up? I got access to OpenAI Open AI recently. I should probably use that to try and uh, get to the edge of a lot of this because it's hard to keep up. You know, it's like there's so much going on, and I I, I spend every day, all day, weekend, weekday. And I feel like I know like 0.0001% of what's happening in this space. And how can the average person even like, oh, it's, it's got to be tough. Um, okay. So, okay. So anything else on Avalanche? Are we good? Do you want to move on to the last question? I, I noticed we only have eight minutes left. It kind of, time kind of went fast there. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. 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 I, yeah okay. okay. So the, to the last, last question I had, well, I mean, I have a few more if we have time, but the last main yeah, question sure. is, what is one truth that you hold that most other, let's say, crypto people would disagree with you on? Because you're in the avalanche space. This mm -hmm. time. What, what would you say one thing that uh, that most others would in the crypto space would disagree with you on? Ah, uh, it's a good question. Or Let you could even think. Say, yeah, you could even actually. If it's easier for you, you could even say Bitcoin. <laughs> because I mean, then it might just be like, well, it's avalanche. Yeah, <laughs> then, I, I, most I, I, wouldn't... yeah at least I think that uh, in my perspective, in my day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, everyone in, in, in Latin America uh, begins this trip with Bitcoin. And I, I uh, as you mentioned, I, I'm not sure why uh, uh, sometimes uh, I would say that Bitcoiners, uh, like like, like uh, maximalist, really strong, are against uh, the 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 own innovation in the space. You know, mm -hmm. so I would say avalanche is just a a, a, a normal innovation, a normal uh, evolved 
path on, on, on the space. And you just have a look on, 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 the, on the math, on the computer uh, basis of it, and, and just, just have a look, you know, and, tr and mm. try to, 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 to do it. Because uh, for me, Latin America is quite easy because there are not the, the, to these people that uh, Bitcoin maximalists and say that everything else is a scam. Of course, there are, but there are few. Uh, but I, I have seen in, in other uh, areas that yeah, that it's, uh, Bitcoin maximalism is is quite toxic. Let's say, let's say, and I don't really understand why uh, these guys are against the the innovation in the space, and they say no, it's a scam. Hey, just have a look at the at the math. How uh, look how it works actually. But they, no, no, it, I, I don't. I don't have time even to see it or to read something about it, and it's against uh, the basis of the of Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin is a disruption and an innovation itself. We are not going to stop innovation. We are not going to 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 stop disruption in in its own uh, sector in, in in its own field. From my point of view, I don't. I don't really get why. Um, People goes to this side of, of, of toxicity, you know, and and I really enjoy in having this conversation conversation with with people that really understand people. I mean, sorry, understand Bitcoin, but to say, but I'm open to to understand other technology, and and yeah, I, I don't really get if if Satoshi saw this toxicity in the space. I'm sure that he will wonder what the hell is going on. <laughs> At least from my point of view, that I think that that's easy, uh, uh, easy to say because uh, yeah, in Latin America, there are some people that are really have these ideas of, of if, if it's not Bitcoin, it's a scam. Uh, but I really don't have too much uh, conversation with them because it's not, not even possible to to talk with them, and and I I think that it's a pity to to uh, not to have this conversation and not to have this this exchange of ideas, you know, because they don't really not even hear you. They they are close to new ideas, and I think that it's it's, uh, it's yeah it's a pity not to have this this exchange of ideas, and it's great to 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 have this conversation with people just like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, no, I know what you, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, and I've been right in the middle of a lot of it. I've seen a lot of it firsthand. Um, I kind of, I kind of get it though. I think, I think, I think there's just so many scams and people trying to steal people's Bitcoins and, you know, Rujas, one coin to BitConnect, you know, all <laughs> these like random things happening that I think, um, I think a lot of people have been fleeced. A lot of people have been screwed, you know, Quadriga yeah. in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it's just this, this, it's, it's like, it's like, have you seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? That movie, the war yeah. movie where yeah. they get out of the, the <laughs> ship and there's just like, there's like carnage and a guy with his arm on the ground. Uh, Bitcoin's kind of like that. So I think, I think just to like keep your sanity, people are just like, you know, like, with like their their horse whatever thing on and they're just kind of like okay this is the way but i think you know along the way i think people forget though that bitcoin is open source <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah, yeah and sure, so sure. if satoshi didn't want people to copy it then uh he or she or it would not have made it open source so if you love the fact that bitcoin is open source you kind of mm -hmm. have to embrace a lot of this and yeah, so so I do. Uh, I, I I like to. I try to. In fact, I but I I have also been very public about the fact that I you know did not invest in Ethereum's ICO <laughs> or not ICO, whatever they call it. Um, and you know, and uh, I probably would have made a lot of money if I had. And uh, <laughs> like that, I've seen a lot of things come and go. And so you know, and so I, I try and maintain an open mind and, uh, you know, and so encourage other people to do so as well. Um, but you know, it's, it is complex. Like, it's like, Oh, like, I mean, we did an hour and a half right now. And <laughs> like, I don't even really like, I mean, I get it, but it's like, yeah. 
you know what I mean? Like there's a lot to unpack in terms of like staking versus proof of work. And you know what I mean? Like what is the actual math? I mean, but that, that, that I think would probably be better after once I've, because I, quite frankly, I haven't read everything and, and, you know, and, and I'm not, like I said, promoting this is more just, it's about Bitcoin stories. So I'm, I'm always encouraged. I mean, Hey, look, you guys raised what you said, Mill, lots of lots of money. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And so uh, the market is probably interested. Emin sounds like a good guy. I've never met him, but uh, okay, Ricardo. Um, I think that's all I got. I mean, like I said, I had a bunch of other ones. We could do a follow up in the future if you're ever yeah, you know sure. interested, available, and kind of just. Uh, other than that, um, you know, you shared a bit about your website, but what about on on, on a personal note? If people want to uh, sure. yeah. like uh, follow your kind of you know train of thought, you have Twitter. Is it LinkedIn? You have a website. Yeah, sure. I, I really enjoy time on, on Twitter. So my uh, username is Ricardo Oruca. I, I'm going to write it and perhaps you, you, you can share with your... your sure. Uh, sure. Um, and yeah, um, I think that um, LinkedIn, you can um, look for me just with my name that is around here, Ricardo Vasquez Gutierrez. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to keep the conversation. I, I'm sure that uh, I, I will uh, invite Boone or Kevin uh, or Ted Jean, and for sure that they will be happy to, to join uh, this, this conversation. And for, I'm sure, totally sure that they will explain all the details from uh, the technical side. And it's going to be as, as fun as uh this space can, can, mm -hmm. can be yeah we could even do like a screen share go into the code go into the math oh man i love that stuff so uh but but you know but for your time i'm i'm grateful ricardo has, has been great uh catching up you know i think it's been you know what you said a year year and a half and so mm -hmm. time flies and you know I, when I saw you, I did, if you would have asked me, Sonny, what are the odds that Uno coin would actually win this, 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 whatever, this Supreme court case, uh, I, like, I don't know if you could sense it, but I was definitely like, okay, that's a thing of the past now. Like I can't <laughs> to speak because I'm like super bitter about, you know, the whole experience. And, and so it was a bit of a surprise when, when we won. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm really happy. I'm in a good place. I'm glad, I'm glad we got to do this. And with that, I guess we'll bring it to a close and, uh, yeah. You know, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. All right, let's kill it here.